focus on the breath to train the heart and the mind. In Pali, they use one word, citta, to cover both what we mean by heart and mind. The mind, the calculating part, the reasons, takes things apart, tries to understand them. The heart, the part that wants true happiness, that wishes well, the good heart, and you're trying to create a good mind as well. In fact, that's an important principle in learning how to observe the mind. Train it to be good first. Train the heart to be good. And it's a lot easier to observe it. We're observing it for two reasons. One, to see what it's doing. And then two, to see the worth of what it's doing. Because as the Buddha pointed out, some of the things we do lead to suffering. Some of the things we do could lead to the end of suffering. There's an obvious value judgment there. We don't just say, well, isn't it interesting this action leads to suffering? Well, that one doesn't. We want to take advantage of that knowledge so we can focus on abandoning the actions that lead to suffering and developing the ones that lead away. This is where meditation doesn't just float midair. It's based on acts of generosity, acts of virtue. Because when you train the mind to be generous and you train it to be virtuous, it's a lot easier to watch. You've been dishonest about things, lazy about things. harmful in your behavior. It's very easy to put up walls of denial. And then when you've got walls of denial, how are you going to see anything? This is why the Buddha said that right mindfulness is based on right view, but also on virtue. It takes a certain goodness that you develop in the mind to be able to remember things. Because you don't have to put up walls. And you can reflect on your actions, and it gives rise to a sense of well-being. This, the Buddha said, is an important part of getting the mind into concentration. Sometimes we think we get the mind into concentration to get the well-being. But he says there has to be some well-being first, a sense of gladness. This can be created by reflecting on your virtue, reflecting on your generosity living in a harmonious community, by reflecting on that, the mind feels ease, it feels joy, it has a sense of self-worth, a sense of its own fortunate circumstances, and it's a lot easier for the mind then to settle down. Because there will be times when it's hard to get the mind to stay with the breath. It seems to be wandering off other places. And it's easy to get discouraged. And if the narrative of your life leading up to the meditation is not all that good, then this just becomes one more part of that bad narrative, that you can't get it together, you can't do this right. But if you're coming with a sense of well-being, a sense of competence and confidence, then it's easier to take these difficulties in stride. You fall down, you pick yourself up, dust yourself off, and keep going. Fall down again, don't get discouraged, pick yourself up, keep going. That's an attitude you can develop best by developing a generous heart, a virtuous heart. And as things begin to come together, this is one of the best ways to observe the mind in action, watching it do something right. And of course, the fact that the mind is more and more still makes it easier to see things clearly. You need the stillness, but you also need a quality of discernment, watching yourself in action. So 
so you can judge what's worth doing and what's not worth doing. So you have stillness, you have mindfulness, alertness. These are the things that make you a reliable judge. Because a lot of the insights come along, and they don't come with a certification. You said this has passed the test from other people. You have to be able to judge when the mind sees something. How reliable is its vision? And of course, it gets more and more reliable as you practice. It requires a constant reflection. The other way you see the mind in action, of course, is once you've got it still, you try to maintain it. And in the maintaining it, you'll run into other thoughts, other intentions. And you want to learn how to see how they form. In the beginning, you're sitting here with the breath, and then not knowing what happened, you're someplace else. Well, the mind has blinded itself, created this big blank. So you have to realize the next time you get the mind still, you want to maintain that stillness and be on the lookout for when a thought may begin, because it begins very subtly. And sometimes the mind has a tendency to even lie to itself. Thinking of the mind as a committee. Some of the committee members have decided they want to slip away as soon as your mindfulness lapses. They're all ready to go. There's a lapse and they're gone. Well, you want to see that point where they made up their decision to be ready to go. They've done psychological experiments where they can get determined by brainwaves that someone has made a decision. Yet the person they're studying doesn't realize that the decision has been made. Of course, the scientists say that this is proof that the brain is making the decision without your interference. You're just sitting on the receiving end. What it's actually proof of is our mind's ability to hide things from itself. The more stillness you can bring to the mind, the more you're ready to see the distractions as they form. The Earlier on, you catch them in the process, and you begin to see there's a little stirring. It's hard to say whether it's in the breath or in the mind. It's on the borderline between the two. And then you can either identify it as a physical stirring, which you can just breathe through, or it's mental. It has a meaning. You slap a perception on it and say, this is a thought about X, about the future, about the past, whatever. And then you go with it. Start weaving things around it. So you're trying to catch that process earlier and earlier. And the way to do that is as soon as you've noticed that you want it off, you drop whatever the thought is. You don't have to finish it. You can leave the ends dangling. But make up your mind you're not going to try to peer into it and say, well, how far can this thought go before I go back to the breath? Just drop it, drop it, drop it. For the time being, the thoughts of that sort have no worth at all. They may have worth in terms of the world outside, but for the time being, you're putting aside greed and distress with the reverence of the world. That's what the texts say. So the thoughts have no meaning, no worth. And you can regard them that way. Then you can see more clearly what's happening in the mind. And the best thing of all is when you start seeing how the mind has deceived itself, but you're not taken in by the deception. And the part that really hurts, of course, is knowing that there are times when not only does the mind try to deceive itself, but it likes to go along with the deception. But here you're changing your values. It's because you get better and better at noticing what's coming out of the mind. So when the Dharma eye arises, in other words, the point of stream entry, you've been seeing how you fabricate distracting thoughts, you've been seeing how you can fabricate very subtle states of concentration, 
So your sensitivity to fabrication is more and more acute. So when the mind has this point where it has no fabrication in the present moment at all, and everything falls apart, all the six senses fall apart, and you have an experience of the deathless, and you know that's what it is, because you become so sensitive to what the mind has been doing all along. That's why it's expressed as whatever is subject to origination is all subject to cessation. Because you found something that's not subject to origination, and it doesn't cease. It's your honesty and your sensitivity together that allow you to see that and to pass that judgment and, and to trust that judgment. And that's just the first level of awakening. As the mind progresses, it gets better and better at observing itself and observing what actions are worthwhile and which ones are not. Because insight is a value judgment. As you see what's originated in the mind, you see how it passes away, and you see what the allure is. Why do you go for that kind of fabrication? And then you look for the drawbacks. And if the allure is greater than the drawbacks, you're not going to let it go. But when you see the drawbacks is greater, then you ask yourself, well, why continue with this? It's not worth it. A waste of energy, a waste of time. That's when you develop this passion for it and gain the escape. So we're getting to see the mind in action, both to understand exactly what's going on. That's part of the the mind part. And then the heart part says, is this worth it? The activity that goes into getting concentrated for the time being is worth it. But as the mind gets more and more sensitive and your heart gets more and more sensitive, there comes a point when you say, no, it's not. That's why you look for the way out. So you're trying to see things as they're happening. Insight is not just seeing things as they are. The Pali term actually means seeing things as they've come to be, the process by which they've come to be. And then you have that value judgment. Is it worth it? Is it not? This passion, after all, which the Buddha said is the highest dharma, is a value judgment. These things are not worth it. And that's how you get out. So the question of how you know when you reach a state that doesn't die, it's because you've trained yourself to be a good observer, getting the mind still so it can see subtle things, making it honest, and having a strong sense of goodwill for yourself, really wanting to do what is for your best interests. That's how you know that your observations are reliable. And that they've taken you where you want to go.